My name is Steve Demas. I'm the founder of uh, White Wave Incorporated, which was uh, founded in 1977. We were the makers, the proud makers of the most hated food in America for a long time. That was tofu. Uh, we went on to inventing and uh, developing a soy milk uh, by the name of uh, Silk, the brand name Silk. Uh, Silk was uh, ultimately became the largest selling organic food or organic brand in the world. Uh, held about 16% of the market share for soy milk in the world and uh, penetrated over 15 million homes and 98% of the supermarkets in the United States. Uh, we ultimately sold our business uh, to Dean Foods. We took an investment from them in the year 2000 and we, um, we completed the transaction or actually sold controlling interest to the company in 2003. Uh, Dean Foods out of uh, Dallas, Texas was the uh, purchaser of, um, of White Wave and Greg Engels is the chairman at Dean. Sustainability was not an add-on to White Wave. It was at the deepest root of the company. Um, we began as a right livelihood business in 1977 with a commitment um, to demonstrate uh, that uh, we had what we considered to be a superior profit and ethics model. So in our, at our deepest root, we wanted our business model to be the longest lasting and most sustainable aspect of our business. We were also um, deeply committed to the organic and environmental movement from day one. We were the largest and first producer, uh, purchaser, excuse me, of uh, wind credits and wind energy, um, devoting our entire supply chain uh, to wind energy um, over five, seven years ago. We were uh, significant contributors to Amnesty International, the AIDS Project, the Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure, the homeless. Um, we were committed to social responsibility and personal fulfillment in the context of right livelihood. After 20 some years, I had a moral and, uh, responsibility to return to my investors. My investors had initi initially invested in White Wave in 1977 through 1979. I never had any um, requirement from them uh, for a return on that investment, but one of the concepts of Right Livelihood is that it absolutely has to return to all who have touched the business, not only the employees, not only the consumers, not only the community, but obviously the investors. And at the time that I decided uh, to return that investment, it preceded um, somewhat the landslide of interest that soy uh, ultimately gained in the United States. So we sold the business um, with the intent of returning to our investors after they had remained silent for 20 years. No, I didn't want to sell the business. Actually, I wanted to take the business public. Um, because I felt that I could return the capital uh, to them, uh, to the investors that way. But that requires a commitment from a very large team because the concept of taking uh, the action, the process of taking a company public uh, requires a, a very strong commitment on the management team because it's a fairly brutal and long-lasting process. Uh, the team really didn't want to go that direction. Um, it had been two decades that we had been running the business. And um, I agreed with them and said, that's fine. Um, we would sell the business and I would go out and start another one. I'm going to digress on you for a second and then answer your question because I think it's uh, an Im important digression. I think there are two ways that you can accomplish right livelihood and conscious business. One of which is to infuse the business and the product so deeply with the qualities associated and the with uh, the virtue and ethics that you've taken and then pass that on um, to another company and let them manage those virtues. Another is to hold on to the business and breathe into it and continue to demonstrate those virtues. We chose 
to, um, to go the former path. We chose to so deeply infuse the product and ingrain it with our value system that it wouldn't be able, um, the values and the ethics wouldn't be able to be teased apart uh, from the product and thus it could be run by virtually any company in the United States. So at the time that we decided um, to capitalize, monetize our business and our stockholders, uh, we interviewed uh, the largest corporations in the food industry uh, in the world. Uh, anywhere from Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Nestle, um, and Dean Foods, which at that time was the world's largest dairy. The terms and conditions that we, um, we sold the business or took investment in the business was a two-stage process. We took um, an initial investment in uh, the year 2000 of $5 million. The $5 million uh, uh, sold effectively um, about, if I remember correctly, 20 to 23 percent of the business. At that time, we were doing 14 million dollars a year in business, and we were break even. We had been around for uh, 20 years, um, and we were probably one of the leading, if not the leading, soy in, uh, company, a natural and organic soy company in the industry. Um, but the industry was very small at that time. It was primarily revolving around tofu, and soy milk hadn't really come of age. Um, there were very few people in the soy milk industry at that point, and the entire industry um, w was a maximum of 65 to $70 million manufactured value in the U.S. So when we took in the investment, uh, our company was valued at about $20-some million, 17 to $20 million, if the math is correct. Uh, and memory is correct. Um, and we committed at that time, uh, in exchange for the five million, to, um, uh, to agree to a full purchase of the company three years afterwards. And the terms of that ultimate um, change of control purchase was such that um, we would grow the business for three years with the use of um, the five million dollars plus additional capital coming um, from the corporation and at the end of three years we would have a fair market value assessed um, on the business by three independent um, financial bankers, investment bankers. Uh, during the interim we would be given the rights um, and the full autonomy uh, to run the business uh, with total uh, discretion. Um, the corporation that invested in us at that point, Dean, only owned a third of the business so we had absolute control. Dean Foods, when they invested the $5 million in us, was Dean Foods out of Chicago. It was the largest dairy in the United States, but it wasn't ultimately the company that we took over with, were taken over by or acquired by. The $5 million was, uh, represented $17 to $20 million worth of investment, uh, 17 to 20% of the companies uh, in the investment. And there was a clause that stated that we would sell the business to them uh, after three years on what could be termed an earn, earn out or uh, a fair market value after three years as determined by three independent uh, investment bankers. We grew the business from uh, $14 million in 2000 to about a $129 million um, after three years and we sold the business for uh, $289 or $296 something like that million dollars um, in 2003 with an additional $35 million incentive um, for us to set, uh, for the management team to stay. So effectively we sold the business in 2003 for about $330 million. During the time that um, we were running the business from initial investment until actually when I left it um, in 2005, we had complete control over uh, all capital expenditures, all uh, distributions of uh, resources and all uh, market initiatives. So we were an autonomous division and the arrangement that I had with the chairman of, uh, of Dean Foods, which um, was uh, at that point located in uh, Dallas, Texas by, with uh, a man by the name of Greg Engels, the arrangement that I had was that I would be bring green 
to Dean Foods, and green meaning sustainability, social responsibility, and a connection uh, to the organic and natural products industry. And he would bring green uh, to White Wave, and that was that we would um, bring our business to Wall Street. So our intent in 2003 and 2004 was to grow the business up to being a rather significant um, uh, aspect of the Dean family and we would spin that business off and then take it independently public and run it as a, um, a standalone uh, publicly owned company. I, I, had, uh, I had no hesitancy whatsoever in selling the business and I had no serious challenge um, with the uh, merge and integration with Dean. Um, I felt that it was in the best interest of the business that the world for soy was opening up very quickly and somebody was going to be a household brand in the United States for soy. We at White Wave didn't have the capital resources nor uh, did anybody on the planet have the capabilities of building the factories fast enough to keep up with the demand as it was coming to market. So our strategy was to leverage the infrastructure of the existent packaging and bottling or cartoning processing systems in the United States and uh, thus achieve the first to market status. Um, Silk achieved first to market status. It achieved the halo surrounding were the ones that introduced the, the, the mainstream consumer um, to uh, organic soy milk in the United States. So our uh, interests were furthered by aligning with, at that time, a $10 billion company, and we were given full power with which to run that. So the challenges really were, how do you keep up? How do you continue to deliver uh, a high, high quality product that um, has a deep root in social responsibility and a deep root in the organic uh, industry and environmental stewardship um, and still meet an explosive demand of growing 2,000 percent in, um, for several uh, year, consistent years, achieving this 2,000 percent growth over a five-year period. Um, so our biggest challenge was perfecting our professional skills and keeping up with the demand that um, uh, growth in the hundreds of percents puts on a management team. Interestingly, uh, the senior management team of White Wave that was present at $8 million, $10 million, and $14 million is the exact same management team that ultimately delivered uh, silk to uh, 96 plus percent of the supermarkets in the U.S. $360 million in annual revenue. So we were very fortunate in keeping uh, what was called the Jazz Club, but the top uh, four, excuse me, five uh, managers intact um, during the entire growth. Uh, no, uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, our philosophy was not to contractually obligate um, a corporation because, frankly, uh, contracts have lifespans. And so, do, whether it's a work contract or a purchase contract, when a corporation owns the majority control of the equity of a business, they own the rights to do what they need to do to further the interests of their investment. And those contracts will have a lifespan to them. And when that lifespan is exhausted, then the corporation has the right to do whatever they please to. Our belief was that if we, as you have stated, uh, bake the values into the business, we so deeply infused the product with the values that aligned um, with what the consumer was buying, that it would be a fool who teased apart the values of the product, the association of the brand and its uh, actual uh, deep value, if they teased those apart and they degraded the product, they degraded their own investment. 
So we didn't try and bake them into the contract. We tried to bake them into the product so that the product could stand alone. And at this point, the product still remains uh, probably the top selling organic single brand in the United States, possibly the world. We all, all stayed for the jazz. We, all st we had no contracts. We had a financial incentives that was, I was offered a $35 million, a $30 million as a base amount uh, to stay with the company when we sold it. I personally was. I turned around and distributed two-thirds of that back um, to the vice presidents and the reporting directors of the company to stay with me and see how far we could grow it. Um, when I left, they left. I left because um, Dean Foods decided after they had paid this enormous incentive uh, in a two-year period, they paid us their 30-some million dollars plus our salaries plus our yearly bonuses uh, and stock options. So it was a pretty um, sizable financial incentive. Um, but innovation was not the driving force for Dean Foods at that time. The business had become a brand that in our estimations was headed to a billion dollars and we felt that we could get it there if we added additional inf innovation to the product lineup. The uh, board of directors and the chairman at Dean Foods did not agree with us. So when I left, everybody left. The senior team all resigned within uh, 60 days and the mid-level team all resigned within the next 90 to 120 days. So our contract was a moral contract. Our contract was a commitment um, to our product and our values and when we felt um, that we had done as much as we possibly could to further them, we left the company. Nothing. I would do nothing differently. Um, I have started another business. I have infused it with right livelihood from day one before we ever sold a product. We were carbon neutral before we ever sold a product. Um, we were socially responsible and picked our specific charitable areas that will work to further. Uh, we found a product with a human benefit. Uh, we hired a team who is deeply committed to virtues of right livelihood. Um, we found uh, resources of money, which is endowments for major universities that's clean money. This is identical to what we did with White Wave. I would do nothing differently. I would have no qualms about selling the business another business a second time with a product that is deeply infused um, with the values and the culture is deeply infused with those values uh, as well. Um, everybody that you'll interview will have a different opinion. Everybody that you'll interview, uh, possibly, this is my, my opinion. We'll have a different opinion and view on conscious capitalism, right livelihood, um, evolved commerce, whatever term we want to give it. We are effectively the bleeding heart liberals of the 60s, and we decided um, we're not in the natural foods business. We're in the social change business. We just happen to all take on food um, and some other uh, products as our arena to demonstrate uh, this higher form of uh, capitalism, if you will. But to me, the most important thing that we can all aspire to do is demonstrate um, right livelihood. It's not a question of whether I can bolt something onto this business and then align a consumer to say, well, don't you think that business should have this and don't you think business should have that? In fact, the most valuable thing I can do is infuse from the very conception, the very conceiving of the business all of these values are so deeply rooted into the business that they, uh, that's what we project. So our goal is to demonstrate right livelihood. I wouldn't change anything because all I know how to do is demonstrate right livelihood. And when I can't demonstrate right livelihood, I shouldn't be in business. So if we can really effectively change capitalism, it will be by demonstrating that I can make more money than you can make by a conventional form of business. And if I, can if I can attract you 
to demonstrating values and virtues and creating enormous wealth out of doing that, then I can change Wall Street, I can change capitalism, and so can everybody else who demonstrates that good values-based moral, ethical business is more valuable to society and to your personal wealth creation than anything else that you can possibly do. So I can have a great idea and I can go out and mine that field and create enormous wealth, but if I don't create fulfillment, then I, don't, I won't create the maximum amount of wealth that I possibly can. So my role, I'm going to be the poster child for going out and creating personal wealth and demonstrating social responsibility while I do it. And I hope an awful lot of really, really smart people go, you know, he's right. I can create all the money and I can create all the wealth in the world for myself and I can feel good about my life and I can feel good about business and what I've done by um, choosing carefully how I make my living, how I infuse my culture with values, how I infuse my product with values. It's not a question of whether I can control a corporate governance committee or I can control a contract. It's a question of whether I can demonstrate every day with every action that this is right livelihood. Right livelihood is the value, not what I do. Right livelihood is the simplest concept um, that we can possibly come up with in business. It's probably the golden rule of business and it's going to be dismissed because of its simplicity. It's uh, summed up in basically 10 seconds. Uh, good for me, good for you, and good for everything that touches it. So if you want to define that further, uh, good for me means it has to fulfill me. It has to create my livelihood. It has to return to me against the investment I put in. Good for you means it can't harm you. It has to benefit you. It has to bring something of value to your life. And good for everybody who touches it is possibly the most important aspect. And that means it can't rape and pillage the culture. It can't take the environment and exploit it and end up in a dead end. It has to give back from the world that it extracts from. So it's really a very, very simple concept, but it's a very narrow path, and it's a very difficult series of choices that you must be conscious at every moment. You can't sell a heart attack in a cup and be... Um, virtuous and call it right livelihood. You can't be well intended and sell fishing hooks and say this is good for everything that touches it. You can't um, exploit and mine uh, uh, resources from the planet that are non-sustainable even though there's a benefit to humanity and call it right livelihood. It has to meet every one of those criteria and then it's right livelihood. I don't think it's a tip about selling, I think it's a tip about doing. And that's breathe in real deep with all of your values and shoot for the moon because if you don't, no one else will.